Welcome to Brave. Be inspired by the best leaders of Southeast Asia tech. Build the future, learn from our past, and stay human in between. I'm Jeremy Ao, a VC, founder, and father. Join us for transcripts, analysis, and community at www.jeremyao.com. Hey, Remy, good to have you on the show. Hey, Jeremy, it's great to be here. I'm really excited because you are a classic student slash founder who started our university. And it's always an interesting thing to see how you're thinking about things at this point of time. And I guess we'll revisit this in 10 years and see how you think about this interview right. <laughs> in 10 years time as well. So Raimi, can you just you know, introduce yourself to everybody? Yeah, so my name is Raimi, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Data Ideas. Today, we run the largest community of couples in Singapore with over 50,000 subscribers and over 20,000 weekly active users. So six months ago, we launched our mobile app that provides couples with unique date recommendations for their dates and have since sold close to $100,000 worth of date experiences with double-digit revenue growth. So really excited about that. But for me, my lifelong mantra is really to inspire young entrepreneurs to solve only the world's most challenging problems that wouldn't be solved if they didn't exist. And these are typically problems that sit on the crossroads between deeply entrenched social issues and newest innovations in technology. So yeah, I really want to inspire and, and really motivate new entrepreneurs to solve those problems. Awesome. So how did this entrepreneurial bug bite you? Yeah, I think very similar to other people, there's always some program or some experience that really was a bug. And it's the same for me. So back in my national service days, even before university, I actually always wanted to be a chemical engineer. So that's why I took chemical engineering degree in university. But I was also very thankful because I qualified for this double degree program. So I took business as my second degree. But back then, I didn't know about anything about entrepreneurship. And I, I participated in this program where they invited entrepreneurs down to speak. So back then, I always thought that business never really motivated me because I thought it was always buying something cheap, selling something at a higher price, and then you gain some profits out of it. But during that program, I met entrepreneurs who were super down to earth. They, they didn't wear suits. They speak in a very similar language as I did. And most importantly, through the program, we managed to sort of win the first prize for this like mini startup idea competition. We got a $7,000 grant. And I thought, okay, okay, how, how many receipts do we need to claim and what should we do and all that? But the next day, they just asked for our bank account. And immediately, they just transferred $7,000 over, trusting that we're going to use it for the project. So that really got me thinking like, wow, this, this whole ecosystem is built on trust, built on sort of like reducing the barriers to entry to entrepreneurship. And yeah, that was a very small pro project that we worked on. We sort of exited that about eight months in because we realized we, we weren't really solving a core problem. But that was the moment that those eight months was really the best time of my life because I would like really just spend hours working on that project and I really enjoyed it. So I knew when uni started that I was going to go full-time onto entrepreneurship, hopefully after I graduated, yeah. Okay, that's something that's fun and this NOC program feels like it's something a lot of people talk about. So what was your experience about NOC and what's your reflection about that process? Yeah, so um, very fortunately, I entered university already knowing I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I started Data Ideas even before going on NOC. So it made the application a lot easier, thankfully. But of course, it was a very small project. But yeah, for those who don't know, NUS Overseas Colleges, is we, set, we get sent to different colleges around the world. And I was thankful to go to Silicon Valley. So I spent one year there doing an internship, also taking some part-time classes in Stanford. And... I think most importantly, the ecosystem there was something that really inspired me. Coming from a perspective of someone who really wanted to be an entrepreneur, I was very hungry trying to gain as much as possible from the whole ecosystem. So every weekend there would be hackathons. So I was thankful I took part in 27 hackathons every weekend in, in the valley and I, I was fortunate to win prizes for 20 of them. But the most important thing was Every hackathon I went to, I didn't go with the same team. I always went alone uh, and wanted to meet new people from a new team and work on a new idea. So yeah, that was amazing because at the end of the year, I managed to network with at least 100 to 150 developers or software engineers whom I still keep in touch with today. Um, of course, beyond that as well, the Valley itself had so many people who are so courageous. I don't think they were a lot smarter than people in Singapore, Southeast Asia. I don't think they are a lot more hardworking than us. 
But I think what they have a lot of is the courage, the guts to really throw everything behind, believing that they're going to make something work out. So yeah, when I got back from the Valley, much to the disdain of my parents, I, I decided to take a gap semester to work on data ideas full time because I knew that I didn't want to come back and become the same person I, I was before embarking on the journey. And I wanted to borrow that guts, that courage that I, I, I felt over there. So yeah, uh, it was amazing because during the gap semester, we, we grew our community from 2,000 to 20,000 subscribers. We managed to get our first $10,000 in revenues. And yeah, I think that was more than enough to convince my parents and myself that, yeah, I'm going to do it full time after graduating. So how did you come up with the idea, right? Dating, were you single back then? Were you in a relationship? How did it you know, come together? Yeah, so I think when university started, I was already looking for problems to solve. Of course, best if it's a personal problem, and if not, it's uh, the people around you have the problem, so it's easy to get information and insights on them. Yeah, so back then, I was uh, also going on dates with one person, but most importantly, always a headache and always depended on the males or in a heterogeneous relationship to really decide what to do on dates. And also my friends were also facing the same problem because they always turned to Groupon. Back then there was Groupon, but they mentioned it's all very messy. The user experience was really bad. And that, that really sparked the problem to be solved. And also a problem that I myself knew I could solve. And yeah, so then the next step would be all of that happened in layers after that. You don't want to build a full app from day one. So we started off from Telegram. Back then, very few people used Telegram back in 2018. In fact, I didn't use Telegram before starting Date Idea. So I, I saw my friend was using it. I downloaded Telegram for the first time. And the first thing I did was to create this Telegram channel because I wanted to validate or build an MVP without actually spending too much time and resources. Yeah, so I started that way. Started getting 10 or 15 websites to, to source for potential date ideas to at least provide the supply of content in that Telegram community. And yeah, after, after getting that whole pipeline set up, then the next layer would be finding your first users. I think a lot of people struggle with the first 1,000 users. What I did was I just sent a message to 200 of my friends, asked them to join this community. And I told myself, if this community started dropping below 50, I knew that I'm going to just call it quits because nobody saw value in what we were trying to do. But thankfully, every day, it grew by a, a, a little, right? 205, 210, 215, without me doing anything. I was just, just doing the content publishing and that showed that people were spreading the word. So I would say it's important to know from day one that you are adding value. If, if you are doing something that is evident that people are leaving, don't get so... So don't believe in your idea so much. You have to be honest and just cut it short and move on to something else. But we are lucky to, to, be, to see traction from day one. So what's so interesting about this idea, right? Because can't people just Google online and figure out ideas? Like what's so special about this approach that you think is different? Right, right. So I think in the beginning, what we know is 90% of couples actually go to Google to look for new experiences. 10% of them go to those typical marketplace apps like Faith, Klook. Clearly those aren't very good at solving the problem. But the problem with Google is over 85% of people, of couples who go to Google, actually are unhappy with the experience because they spend 45 minutes, one hour to search for something, but all they provide is very generic ideas like, oh, go for a picnic or go to Marina Barrage and fly a kite together. But it's not actionable, right? It's, you still need to do so much planning. And that's where we saw a gap. The marketplace platforms didn't really serve the needs for couples. And then couples who went to Google search were still not very happy with the experience. And so what we wanted to, to do was to merge both of them. And so we launched the platform really providing only couple-centric experiences. So it's a lot more efficient to find what you need to find for a date. But on top of that, what we also launched is our recommendations algorithm. So we realized that there's a strong correlation between love language of couples and the kind of experiences that they kind of enjoy. So for example, couples whose love language is quality time, they tend to prefer intimate dining settings or workshops as ac activities or experiences. And couples whose love language is words of affirmation or gifts, they tend to prefer customized gift sets or experiences that came with a memento that they could bring home. So we use that data to really match the right recommendations to the right couples. And we are only in version one of that algorithm and we already doubled our conversion rate. So very excited about that, really going deep into this niche. And we believe this niche is actually quite big. Yeah, so that's just the tip of the iceberg, but there's a lot of other differentiation factors that we have planned out moving forward. Doesn't it feel a bit contrarian, right? How would you differentiate between the apps that are looking to help you get a date right, right. versus what you are talking about, which is you know, sustaining and nurturing the relationship? So how do you think about those two different categories of apps? 
Yeah, so I would say the different categories are in the same ecosystem, to be honest. The same, back then it was called dating ecosystem, but I like to call it relationships ecosystem. A lot of people think that, oh, after dating, it's, a, uh, it's just uh, the, the rest is, can be done on its own, but I, we don't think so. I think the only today dating apps are becoming more mainstream, although they launched eight years ago. And only today, because of COVID, probably a lot more people are very open to chatting. Oh, I met this person on, on Tinder, on Bumble, on Coffee Meets Bagel. And we believe the second order effect to that is that there's going to be a huge influx of new couples who've met online, who need activities and experiences to get to know each other better over time. The old way of people meeting offline, getting to know each other, cannot work the same way with people who met virtually. And that's where we see a more consolidation of this whole ecosystem where the next three years, these dating apps are still going to compete with each other to capture market share because dating apps are going to be more and more mainstream. But then soon enough, they, they'll realize that, okay, how can they forward integrate their offering to keep the lifetime value of the singles that they match? Our shot is really to grow extremely quickly in the next three years before they start looking at this market. And then we are big enough to be plugged into their ecosystem. So after the match is made, immediately they can have, have like at least hundreds of ideas for, for those matches to go to. So for us, it's zero customer acquisition costs. We might even do a revenue share with them. At the end of the day, we see them as a potential partner or even a potential acquirer as the relationships ecosystem becomes more mature. It feels like the objective feels different because it feels like when you get a date, it's basically not necessarily get the partner, right? It's also just get as many dates as possible. And then... Right, right. Yeah, so the first group of dating apps were like Tinder. They focus on casual dating because back then, the main sort of core market was people who just wanted dates and wanted to, to get that short-term thrill out of it. But if you look at the latest dating apps and even the recent IPO of Bumble, Coffee Meets Bagel as well, they real, I think a lot of the dating apps realize that, hey, there's also a big market of those who are in the dating apps ecosystem to get an actual life partner. So I would say the dating apps, which are not so sort of like uh, similar in terms of vision as us, is Tinder. But the, almost all of the others, like Bumble and Coffee Meets Bagel, they really want to ensure that every match that comes in their ecosystem, they actually lead to a marriage, hopefully. So if you look at their websites, they always advocate, oh, we successfully resulted in like 5,000 marriages or 10,000 marriages. And I think that's where they want more of those kind of serious daters to come in. So it's very much aligned. Yeah, what's interesting, of course, is that the truth is, there is a weird dynamic for these dating apps where the more successful they are, the worse the economics are for them. Yeah. Well, for example, like Tinder, to some extent, they get a lot of activity from people going through swipes and everything. But if they really help people find a lasting forever relationship, then the user quits, right, yeah, at that point of time. Exactly. So there's a weird dynamic where they want you to have fun, obviously, matching and being using a platform. But actually being and having that happy ending actually causes them to have an unhappy ending uh, for the app, right? Yeah. Um, of course, I think it's a bit different for like those that are much more subscription-based, like Match.com or eHarmony. Then these guys are like, you know, you're paying like 30, 40, 50 bucks a month to seriously look for a relationship. The yeah, search is only going to be up to one year. So even though you end the tr service after a year, at least you're happy, right? Because yeah. you paid a month for yeah. services to find your, the one. Right. So there's a kind of interesting dynamic there. And obviously what is interesting about you is that you're kind of like taking on of the downstream activity, right? Yeah. So how are you monetizing it? Right. So today our revenue model is a commission-based approach. Merchants are the ones who pay us 15 to 20% commissions for each experience that's booked through our platform. But moving forward, we are also experimenting with a subscription model because we realize that our retention rates are really high. Every month, at least 50% of our users or monthly active users are repeat users coming back to look for new experiences to purchase. So we're actually exploring a subscription model where either we only show exclusive date ideas that cannot be found elsewhere, and then they pay a, a monthly fee to get access to that, or they just buy for the next five months, five different dates, and we promise that a cheaper price, but also they, they at least they come back to our platform to book all their dates. That's, I mean, going back to the point you brought up, yeah, to, so everyone knows that the unique economics for dating apps is very contradictory because after they cause a match and they leave the platform, they, they don't want them to leave because they want to come back again. They want those people to come back again so they can extract more lifetime value from the customer. But that's why we believe, because our, our downstream activities basically throughout the, the rest of the relationship. So that's a very good way for these dating apps to 
extend that lifetime value through a partner rather than them having to launch their own features. Yeah, that would be an really interesting dynamic because for them, if they're smart enough, they eventually expand it themselves because they already brought a relationship together. So it's a nice way and they already have the brand, they already acquired the customers. So it's only a matter of time for them to do so, especially because the truth is, you know, how much money are you going to spend on a Tinder subscription versus that? It's just like, eh, five, 10, 20 bucks. But the truth is, if I like you as a date, I'm going to spend $100 on the meal. And then on our third date, I'm trying to impress. We buy flowers, we buy gifts. So there's so much more you know, transactional value that's already actually happening downstream of it. So how do you see yourself really kind of like building that out over time? Yeah. Yeah, so basically our vision as a company is really to empower couples' relationships. That's our sort of like our company's mantra. And eventually we don't see our date ideas marketplace as the only feature on the app. We see that more of a subset of the entire ecosystem offerings where we want to provide tools to help couples understand each other better emotionally. So basically helping them take quizzes every month to at least keep them up to date towards what their goals are, whether they're changing in terms of personalities or whether they need to realign each other. And I think that's where the more of a subscription model will come in uh, when we launch these other tools where the marketplace is free. They can buy and, and, and of course pay the commission. The merchants will pay the commission every time a transaction is made. But the other subscription features will be a sort of a premium feature for them to, if they are really serious about making sure their relationship is maintained and sustained for the long term. Of course, counseling and therapy might be one of the features that we launch. Also helping couples align financial goals better because that's one of the top things that couples quarrel, argue, break up. And all these come and sort of like show themselves in our quizzes to make sure they're aligned. Mm. As this is happening, how have you used uh, your own service for your own relationship? Right, right. Yeah, I think it's very effective, basically, because I think for me, our target audience is really busy young adults who don't have that much time to plan everything. Uh, all, all, uh, like, basically, they don't have time to go to Google search, spend one hour to look for something. Yeah, so for me, it's super easy, right? I just filter the date to which, which I'm available because... Uh, I'm, not, I'm not the most free of people. And then immediately I get a very curated list of those activities that are available. And then of course I can filter by location. Uh, again, then I, I get this. So every week, right, our team actually updates new ideas and I don't directly manage that. So I'm even impressed, right? Like recently there's a cotton candy bouquet workshop, which I couldn't, I didn't even understand that such a thing would, would exist. Yeah, but uh, I just booked that recently. So yeah, so many things that, that I can go back for. Very thankful for like, our own platform, basically. <laughs> and your partner's also very happy for it as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. And so in fact, funny enough, what we realized from our data is, again, in a heterogeneous relationship, the women are the ones who browse a lot more, but the men are the ones who book and make the purchase. So we are actually launching this couples linking feature where we allow the women to just bookmark things that they like. And then it's very efficient for the for the guys to like, oh, okay, that, that person likes it. So just just because I, my goal is really as a as the sort of the uh, male in the relationship is to make my partner happy. So yeah, I think very exciting when we launch that feature. Yeah, I can imagine that will help a lot of uh, debates. I think in any relationship, it's always hard to be telepathic, right? And exactly know what the other person wants. Exactly. And so I think one interesting thing that you just talked about was obviously you yourself booking and being surprised about it. Could you share with us one of the days that you use your own platform for your own relationship? How do you go? Yeah, so funny enough, we have this experience on the app itself where you... It's, it's called a special occasion planner. So basically, you just tell uh, someone on our team will jump on a call, a 15-minute call after the person purchases this planner. And then he'll, he or she will talk to the customer about, okay, what, what, do your partner, what does your partner like? What are your preferences? And like, do you want balloons and, and all that? Because it's mainly for a special occasion. And then after that conversation, so we charge that about $50, Singapore dollars for that. Of course, the additional bundles that come alongside is of course have to be paid by the customer itself as a top up so just really a planning service so very thankful for a uh, birthday celebration i managed i mean i wouldn't go so much to the details of what i got but yeah uh, very thankful because everything was really delivered by our team itself so they got the balloon a very big balloon and flowers and, and then i didn't have to do anything all i needed was to show up and then everything would be fulfilled for me so yeah it was a recent birthday celebration and very good because we ended up going to the rooftop at marina bay sands uh, for a meal and then after that there was a surprise and I, I didn't really have to call my friends hey can you prepare this surprise for me it's all our own team handling and fulfilling that so very yeah I think that so far that special occasion planner has, has sold quite quite a lot uh, so far although we launched it about just a couple of months back on the platform yeah 
when you think about the future, what does the future look like for you from your perspective? Yeah, so of course we don't see ourselves as just a Singapore play. I think as a young entrepreneur, a lot of people think that, oh, uh, and some of the bigger companies also made the mistake where they stayed too long within Singapore. And we definitely don't want to do that. Uh, of course, now it's a bit hard because of COVID. But the upcoming features that we're launching is uh, we plan it to be scalable across borders. So basically, we want to generate, sort of build a community of couples that is not just tied towards Singapore. And having date ideas as a marketplace alone uh, is very hyper-local. It's not going to work out. So I mentioned about the quizzes. I mentioned about having forum on the on the platform where couples can launch their own quizzes for other couples to take and, and evaluate their own relationships. Being able to upvote, downvote. It's really that kind of community that we are building. And that's what we're excited about because then couples in other cities can compare their own relationship dynamics with other couples of, and let's say Singapore first. And that's where we really create an ecosystem. So today we actually started building a community of couples uh, in the Philippines on TikTok. And right now, although we started about a month back, we have over 6,000 couples in the community already. And that's really what we're excited about, right? Really scaling fast across Southeast Asia and seeing how we can replicate certain features that have succeeded in Singapore to those cities and how we can use that as a network effect creator over time. Yeah, so going out of Singapore, of course, a lot of inexperienced entrepreneurs might be scared. But to me, I think it's very exciting. It's a whole new world, it's a bigger market as well. Yeah. As you do all this, I'm sure you have been learning a lot because you're so, frankly, younger than me, right? <laughs> it's out of college, it's building. And that reminds me of when I was out of college building my first company as well. And I remember it was a very tough, a lot of great moments, exciting moments, also tough times. Could you share about any tough times you had and how you had to be brave? Yeah, no, Jeremy, I'm so thankful you asked for this because so far it seems like all's good and all's exciting. But the truth is there's so many tough moments. One hour alone is not enough to list all of them. But I would say one of the toughest moments is, of course, finding a strong enough co-founder. I self-learned coding, but I knew that my strengths lie in really being a CEO rather than a CTO. So I was already looking for a co-founder for the longest time. I messaged over 300 people on LinkedIn, our co-founder slept in a few other co-founder matching platforms. I met up with over 50 of them in person and over Zoom, and even tried working with two of them on like probation period. But none of them really fit the bill. So I was really on wits and I was so prepared to really go and become a solo founder until I managed to chance upon Arvin, our current uh, CTO. And that took me like one and a half years to, to finally find him. But the difference is when I first started working with him, it was really like a match made in heaven, for lack of a better term. I mean, since we are also in the dating and relationship space. Yeah, so it was so amazing where suddenly the other two guys before him, it really was so obvious at that moment that they weren't the right fit. And Arvin and myself, we aligned super quickly and we complement each other's strengths. So I would say that would be one of the biggest challenges. And of course, others as well. Right now, we are fundraising. Very thankful because we managed to close more than half the round already and, and we started not too long ago. But of course, the in the early days as well, it was hard to convince investors. But yeah, that's also another challenge. As you climb every mountain, I realized that you would think that, oh, this is the toughest mountain I've climbed. But then again, you, you meet with an even higher mountain and then the previous challenge didn't seem so hard anymore. So that's when you know you're you are really growing and I'm glad so far we are meeting even tougher challenges and slowly but surely we are overcoming them one by one. So the confounder issue is a problem for lots of people and I think it's even more painful, especially for people who are younger in their careers, right? right. Because, I mean, if you're 50 years old, you've probably worked with thousands of people. <laughs> so you already know who's the good one, who's the bad one, you know, so, so forth. You met a lot of different folks. Right. But if I think you've been relatively new, either in terms of your professional career or you're new to the vertical or you're new to the geography, then those things become much harder, right? Because yeah. you're basically scratching, starting a network from scratch. So let's talk about it. So you'll go using co -founder matching platforms, you're getting conversations, doing calls. What was your process like? I'm very thankful because I have both business and engineering background. So I like to make things very structured. At the start, of course, what I did was I went to LinkedIn. I, I was thankful because it was a one month free premium trial, right? So I had unlimited search and, and yeah, all I did was I really search adjacent platforms in the marketplace space where other software engineers have spent like three, five years in. So I reached out to them. I also went to find NUS uh, master students because I really wanted really strong technical co-founders rather than just some, one of my peers in my, my level of university. I think they, they lack a lot of experience. 
so yeah, I, I started off going to LinkedIn and then going to the NUS website, like stalking them on LinkedIn, seeing what they've done and then reaching out to relevant ones. And that made up about 150 of, of the early people I, I reached out to. And then of course I went to co-founder matching platforms like co-founders web. So that's a bit different because uh, they already have a curated list of people who are interested in entrepreneurship, interested to start up. So I ended up going more to those and going, so some of them, the problem is they don't let you see their, the LinkedIn profile. Yeah, they hide it un unless you pay the premium subscription. So I was very thankful this platform co-founders lab, they allowed me to find the LinkedIn profile of those. And yeah, that got me another 50 to 100 leads after narrowing down. Yeah, but I think more importantly, there are tools out there. And of course, a lot of it might be scrappy. I strongly suggest not settling for just the people who are within your network because I went through that as well. It didn't really turn out the best for me after really expanding my network and having the confidence to really talk to people who seem a lot more experienced. I think it really made me grow faster as well. Yeah, and I think that's something that you've been able to build out over the past few years. What's interesting is that you mentioned that there was a stage where you had a couple of candidates and your current uh, co-founder and, you know, he, this guy was like clearly better. So let's talk about that moment before you found out that was clearly better. Let's walk back in that moment. So you must have met these not too bad persons before you met him. So what was that process like? You were working with them and were you feeling like, oh, it's like, it's okay, but not great. What was that feeling like? Yeah, yeah so... It's like product market fit, basically, right? I think at that moment, like, I always thought that, yeah, maybe I have to compromise. Maybe this person is lacking in something as small as being punctual for meetings. I just need to sort of educate him or her. This is what the culture should be like. And then there's other things that he or she would, would be good at. But yeah, there was always a balance of compromise. Uh, we had to align. Maybe something they weren't happy with what I said, and then we have to jump on a separate call to just align that and say, oh, okay, this is how we function, the reason behind that. And so I thought that was a norm. And I believe many inexperienced founders would also think, yeah, it's normal. It's just our founding team. We, we are going to go all the way. Although there are so, some friction between us, but that's always bad because it only gets worse over time. Back then, of course, I convinced myself that it was okay. But I was very thankful because after two, three months, I thought I, I managed to get some mentors who, who told me that, hey, you should really cut it off early. So I really told them, oh, they didn't clear the probation period. And that's where I met Arvin. I think the core difference, again, like product market fit, it doesn't feel like a pull anymore. It feels like a push. So even from day one, after I met Arvin for the first time, I, I felt like, okay, maybe not at this time. I, I should just be a solo founder. But even after that, he kept messaging me. Hey, I have some new ideas that I feel like can be amazing for the platform. Hey, I have some code that I've written that can be replicated and you don't need to write new code and, and all that. So it, it felt more like push him wanting to be part of the journey as much as me wanting it to work as well. So I think that was a very big, sort of indicator, which I wouldn't have thought would be a good indicator. And then after that, because of that push, at first, uh, I wasn't really keen on bringing him on board so early, but he just kept pushing and then I was like, okay, let's just give it a shot. Immediately after that, we, we jump on 30 minute calls every week, catch ups just to make sure we are aligned. And it's really like, it's super aligned. So I would say thereafter, the, the signs a lot more obvious rather than, oh, if you, even if you need an extra call to align certain miscommunication, I think that's a bad sign. Uh, you need to track that properly to see whether these miscommunications happen often. If it happens rarely, then I would say it's good. On top of that also, expectations of each other need to be equally high and, and also equal, right? If let's say you thought that he's going to put in effort in this feature and or, or this part of the product, and then in the end, the output is not as high as you wish, I think that's a very bad sign also. Even if you do sort of convince him this time around, hey, you need to do it better, but the next time around is still off the charts. I think that's a very big red flag that you should immediately reconsider finding a new co-founder. Yeah, that's an interesting dynamic, which is like, if it's not perfect, is it because this is not the right fit or is it just something we can work through? That's a tough moment for everybody to be thinking about. What advice do you have for people trying to make a the decision? There's so many founders walking around with from my perspective, suboptimal pairings. Right, so, right. And also sometimes it's them, sometimes it's the other person, sometimes it's the fit. So how do you give that advice or think about it? Yeah, no, Jeremy, this is a very tough answer. Of course, I would say, in my opinion, because of uh, past data points with other founders, there are other teams which really went to Series A, Series B, and then split up. There are teams that managed to really cut the butt early before anything bad happened. Yeah, but I would say, those who are meant to be good entrepreneurs will stay, no matter what. 
what that means is if you're good and it's not your fault but your co-founder's fault somewhere along the journey that person will leave or you all will split and then you you move on to something greater than that at times if the whole team is bad then either ways whether you you stick or you split it wouldn't work out that well i would say the most important thing is it's more of a natural selection over time if you really believe if an entrepreneur really believes he or she is the one to succeed then i advise that person if if you sense any red flags early just cut it off and move on with someone else you might have to give up some shares because of some vesting period it might not be the most amicable of like conversations or you might be scared of that conversation but i feel if you genuinely believe that you're going to succeed one day it's better to cut that off earlier than later and but for those entrepreneurs who don't have the guts to cut it off and admit that they don't have a strong team i highly doubt that they are meant to do entrepreneurship in the first place to be honest because it's very logical that the earlier you sense problems the earlier you should really solve them rather than waiting and postponing that to another date which will come back and bite them even harder mm. yeah i hope that clarifies so for for me i think i also apply that because every of course every founder would think yeah i'm meant to do entrepreneurship but the more data points and the more you sort of like doubt your team yourself then the more likely you think that okay this is not for me so yeah i i i think like the earlier you sort this out the better so Ian walks in, you know, Avin, right? And he felt good because he kept pushing you and being very enthusiastic and everything. So, and you were already thinking about becoming a solo founder because you were already so frustrated. So, and he, what, it sounds like you already gone through like hundreds of names, maybe even a thousand names at this point. So, what restored your faith, I guess, in uh, not being single anymore and being a bachelor? Right. No, thanks for the analogy. It's uh, very apt. I would say Again, I was still suspicious, right? Although it felt like he was interested, I commenced working with him. I was still very cautious because I didn't want to really like sign something official so early. So it actually took me one year uh, of working with Arvin to make sure that we we sign a proper shareholders agreement, founders agreement. I think one year is a good sort of like threshold to have a probation period, in my opinion. Of course, the longer the better, but I think one year is a good time. If six months, you probably have to work a lot before you sign anything. But I think one year is a good time, and. That was good because even Arvin, he wasn't so pushy. I think he was also logical, mature enough to know that hey, there's no point signing any agreements until we know that we are good fit. Because if not, we're gonna fail anyways. So I think that was a good, very good sign. And and only when it's time to to really open that, we both agreed that it was the right time, and we both agreed that hey, we're gonna do something amazing together. But if that conversation came up and like someone, one of the founders would would think like actually I'm I'm I might join my full time job. Uh, can I do this on the side? And then the other founder be like, no, I'm going to do it full time. Then I think it's never a good sign because you're not putting the similar skin in the game. It's just going to break up eventually. Mm. Doesn't it feel scary for someone like him to be putting in like a year of I don't know part time slash you know helping out work? Feels kind of stupid, no? And unwise if you were his friend telling him like, hey, you're going to give out a year of free work. How did you think about that? Yeah. Yeah. So firstly, just to provide some context, he's a software engineer at Grab,、uh, and he worked in Bloomberg in the past also. So、uh, he's giving up a lot. And I think the biggest thing that converted him was probably me, knowing about my capabilities and understanding how、uh, passionate and serious I am about building a unicorn one day. I think that's what really convinced him. Because even ideas like that could be the most amazing idea, but at the end of the day, it's the people who who find the pivots and tweak the business model to succeed. So if I were to point at one thing that really convinced him, although yeah, if you would want to call it as a more of a questionable decision, right, of like putting hours in for one year, I would say because every meeting we had, every conversation we had, and every sort of like small project we worked on together,、uh, it was a good sign for him that con- like I think the way I behaved, the way I sort of the output I provided, convinced him further that hey, this we might be onto something big. Yeah, so I recommend. I think a lot of Again, inexperienced founders or or people who are new to entrepreneurship, they think that oh, yeah, as long as I do a good job, things like culture doesn't matter. The way I behave around people doesn't matter that much. As long as I I act and I I do so much better in the the work that I do, but it's very it's a very flawed idea.、Uh, it's a fallacy because every single small behavior or action is actually a data point for investors, for potential partners, for potential co-founders to see whether you are really going to succeed or not. I was lucky to learn that very early. Again, I managed to tweak the team culture to be one that's very high performing, and because of that, I think Arvin was convinced that I had the ability to really align different individuals together to achieve something amazing. 
As you do all this, and what's interesting is that you were doing this while you're at college, and which makes total sense because like, you got to graduate, and then other people are off doing CCAs and <laughs> extracurriculars or dating around, and you're like, you get to date and work on the idea at the same time. And what's interesting is that you've just recently graduated a few months ago, right? And so now you're seeing all your friends become bankers, consultants, join a tech startup, be a PM. Were you ever tempted to just like join a normal career? Yeah, the answer is no. I think this is a very fundamental question. Of course, there are different people of different backgrounds. I'm fortunate enough to be able to do it full time without worrying for at least the next three to four years about finances. So I don't think it's suitable for everyone because some people really have to earn to really feed the family and, and all that. But I would say if there was even a thought in your mind that, hey, uh, I have a backup plan, then it's actually an artificial ceiling to how far you can go in entrepreneurship. You keep thinking, like, oh, okay, I don't need to put in so much effort because anyway, there's a job at McKenzie waiting for me or I can just go into an investment banking career. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. That actually happens eventually. So I would say, from what I know, the best entrepreneurs, especially those that came out from college, are those that don't even consider that as an option. It's either all in or all or nothing for them. And I think that's the same for me. Similar as me, right? They started from college, they seem very serious and they, they managed to get even better traction than I did. But when suddenly a carrot came dangling and then they jumped over, it's not a bad choice, but I think they, they actively made that decision. I would say they probably aren't ready for entrepreneurship yet. I'm not saying they won't be in the future, but yeah, I think... I always doubt people who always have this backup plan at the back of their mind. You know, at this stage, you're out, like you said, you know, closing the round and everything, and there's still an 80% chance of failure after closing this round, right? You know, 90%, kind of, in fact. Yeah, <laughs> well, 90%, I think you're a little bit better than the average, right? right. So let's just say 80%. <laughs> How do you feel right. about those odds now? I mean, you know, I think at the end of the day, there's two principles I feel are important. Being a young founder and, and like what you say, 80% of failure, I think number one, manage cash flow. No matter what, as long as you have revenues, as long as your costs, you, you see the amount in your bank, as long as you keep your costs below your revenues, or even if you burn, you, you know you have that much runway. I think no matter what, the longer you stay in the game, the higher your chance of success. Of course, there are some people who are able to burn faster because of different resources uh, that are provided to them. And, and of course, with more resources, the higher your chances of success if you do it the right way. But I think cash flow is important for people like me who doesn't come from a very rich background and doing it for the first time. I think one thing to add also with this point, if you compare young founders with older founders who have a lot more experience, a lot more resources, a lot more network than you, it might seem like, oh, young founders are totally disadvantaged, right? There's no way, right? If an investor comes in, they pro probably put their money in the more experienced person and the younger person. But I think what we have a lot of is time. And this is something that the older folks can never get back. You look at people like Elon Musk, why is he starting SpaceX, Tesla and a bunch of stuff? He's not competing with the competitors in the space, but rather he's competing with time because he wants to achieve all this uh, as soon as possible and, and live to see the day uh, it succeeds. Yeah, so what young founders have is that time. And hence, in my opinion, the longer you stay in the game and you don't die, the higher your chances of success. And because you have that 20 odd years to play around with, that's a, a huge advantage. So that's the first thing. I think the second thing as well is being open-minded and, and adaptable. If you have time, but you're so close-minded and just doing the same things over and over again, despite what investors tell you, despite what your users are telling you. For example, even for me, if this data ideas marketplace seems like, hey, we are not hitting that venture back growth that we are looking for, I think being super open-minded to search for pivots is crucial. I don't subscribe to the view of believing in your vision uh, and really like putting that much hours despite the signs showing. Because maybe being an engineer, I look at data points and that's a lot more important. Of course, there's two different uh, thoughts, right? Schools of thoughts, right? One is, oh, stay true to what you believe in and you'll succeed eventually. And then the other school of thought is you need to be smart and go where the market tells you. If the signs are not showing, then don't. So in my opinion, the former works, but it's highly dependent on luck. Only if the market changes, if let's say you're not going down the right path from the get-go, and only if the market changes in a very fortunate way, suddenly like what you're working on suddenly catches on, then you, you might succeed. But if you are of the latter school of thought where you're very aware and alert on what the market needs and then slowly tweaking yourself towards that direction, then time as an advantage is, is super valuable to help you get there eventually. Yeah, I think these two things are super crucial to, of course, optimize. So, of course, now it's 80%. Slowly, slowly, as, as you spend more time and you, as you become more open-minded and more aware of things, slowly that percentage will, uh, the percentage of failure will, will deplete over time. Yeah. 
Amazing, Remy. So I just want to use, use this time to paraphrase, I think there are three big themes I got from this conversation. The first, of course, is thank you so much for sharing the reality of being a, a student, a founder, and now out there to go there full time. And I think it was just a really interesting point of view just to walk through that chronologically, but also from a personal perspective, what is it like to kind of like go through that whole ideation to founder match to building and so, so forth. So I think it was just a fun set of experiences. The second thing was, of course, thank you for kind of like having that conversation about dating versus relationship apps, but also going into a little bit more about economics and the transactions versus the value and the solution slash value proposition and benefits for different people in the market. And I think that's a really interesting dynamic because I don't think most people are thinking about it beyond just being a consumer of the app versus actually someone being on the other side of it. The third thing that I think that's interesting that you talked about is actually, I think, talking about risk, right? And talking about whether you have done it or not done it or anything whatsoever. So I think that's a really interesting dynamic that you're at. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, very happy to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Thank you for listening to Brave. If you enjoyed this podcast, please share this episode with friends and colleagues. Sign up at www.jeremyow.com to discuss this episode with other community members in our forum. Stay well and stay brave. Stay brave.